and that experience taught me a lot about you need to have awesome fruit sourcing to make an awesome wine at the end of the day. It's really, if you set yourself up for success on the front end and have great fruit and work with your growers on creating that style in the vineyard, it makes your life a lot easier when you get, when that fruit gets to the winery. And then we can put our decoy twist on it once it gets to the winery. But if you're not doing your diligence in the vineyard, you're going to have to do like pull a lot of tricks out of your bag. Welcome to the Listen To Me Wine Podcast. My name is Michael Reyes, and today I'm very excited because we have a total update on the decoy line from the Duckhorn portfolio. With brand new vintages coming out, the 2019 and the 2020, and two new varietals that we just brought into the Philippines. Duckhorn is one of America's biggest wine brands, and in terms of name recognition and in breadth and scopes of brands that they have. Coming out of Napa with Duckhorn Vineyards, they have Paradox, the, their blends, great Pinots and Chardonnays from Migration and GoldenEye. They have a new Paso Robles line with Postmark, Canvas Back up in Washington, and of course, we got Decoy. Decoy is one of my favorite brands because Decoy really brings people into the portfolio. It's their entry level, but not at any, um, uh, they're not giving anything away. You're gonna get some premium, premium wine. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dana Eberson. She is the vice president of Decoy Winemaking and the winemaker for Migration. So, I mean, she really knows what she's talking about. She knows all these varietals in and out. So it's really exciting, to kind of get the inside scoop from Dana and uh, kind of learn how some of our favorite wines are produced. What's great is Decoy is available almost everywhere here in the Philippines. They're on the shelves of the marketplace, supermarket, Wine Depot on their in their stores and online. And of course, they're at Wine Club at wineclub.ph on our online store. So there's no excuse to not get one of these wines. They're great value, uh, great entry level to, to that premium drinking. So when you're getting serious about wine and you want to know what a California varietal is supposed to taste like, a California expression, a Sonoma County expression, Decoy is your go-to. And it's great to taste it along when you're talking with talking with Dana, because she, you know, she she really gives some insights and in how how it's produced and uh, their whole mission and the story behind it. So, uh, without much further ado, here's our conversation with Dana Epperson, Vice President of Decoy Winemaking. Cheers. Welcome to the Listen to Me Wine Podcast. Today we have a very special guest. We have Dana Epperson, v Vice President of Winemaking for Decoy and the winemaker for Migration uh, from the Duckhorn Portfolio. Thank you so much for joining with us. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you for having me. This is really fun. I'm excited. Oh, it's a great, great pleasure. Um, it's always so much fun to meet the people behind the wines that you drink and the wines that uh, you <laughs> grow up with. Uh, I, you know, Decoy, Decoy was one of the wines that really got me serious about wine. Uh, it's that, you know, step into premium. And it's it's that first step into saying, okay, this is a serious wine. This is what a serious wine is like. Uh, it's been really helpful in educating people out here in the Philippines about what you know truly quality wines could be like uh, without breaking the bank. And uh, I just want to say thank you guys so much because a lot of great memories, a right. lot of a uh, lot of good good drinking, and uh, you know, fantastic wine, of course. Yeah, thank um, you. So decoy comes from obviously the very very, very famous brand, Duckhorn. And for the uninitiated, uh, Duckhorn is, in my opinion, one of the best wines, wine pro pro producers in the world. And one of the biggest now that you guys are, are public, a uh, public company, which is very big for right. wine. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you take the uninitiated a little back, back to the roots of Duckhorn and uh, explain why is it so special? Yeah, so Duckhorn, um and decoy and all of the brands within our, our duckhorn portfolio are all very special to us, but we, we have our flagship winery um, that was founded in 1976 by Dan and Margaret Duckhorn. And they um, sort of founded the winery in a time where there weren't a lot of wineries in the Napa Valley and um, really made their mark by being 
Merlot focused, which was new for Napa Valley. Um, a lot of the producers, and there were only about 40 producers in the Valley at the time. Um, they were mostly Cabernet focused, um, some Chardonnay focused, but mostly Cabernet. And it was all sort of an, a new development in the Valley. And they were just seeing what the sub AVAs, you know, could produce and just sort of learning the territory at the time. And Dan and Margaret said, you know, Merlot should be looked at as a serious wine where some of the other producers were just using that varietal as a blender. And they said, no, this wine, it has soft, supple tannins. It's food friendly. It's approachable. And they decided to launch both a Cabernet and a Merlot during that time, um, during their inaugural releases. But that Merlot really became the flagship um, of that winery um, and then sort of helped to drive the style of the other wineries that we've um, either created or acquired along the way. Um, in, they're all sort of in that same realm of having a classic refined style they have a sense of approachability to them um, and an elegance. Um, and we're definitely not really looking to sort of follow the trends in general as a company. Um, our trend has always been to be in that classic refined style. So classic, refined, balanced is, is what we look for in all of our wines. Um, so kind of like maintaining that really, tradition, right? That traditional, exactly. you know, there's nothing, yeah. if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. Exactly. And I think what comes along with that is just really respecting the fruit, respecting the appellations that that fruit is coming from. And so along the way, we have, you know, Duckhorn Vineyards and they're established in Napa Valley. We have Paradox, they're established in Napa Valley. Um, Paradox is known for red blenders. Duckhorn's known for Merlot, Cabernet, Sauvignon Blanc, and now Chardonnay. Um, and our newest winery, not our newest winery to the flock, as we call it, mm -hmm. but our newest uh, winery and tasting room is actually for migration, although migration has been around since 2001. Um, and we just opened a new tasting room in South Napa. So gorgeous, really modern. So really, it'll be fun for people to come visit um, when they're in the area. Um, but that kind of goes along the line of you know, with all the wine wineries that we've established creating the style, um, decoy was actually established back in the beginning. So okay. its roots go back all the way to 1985 when it was the original second label to Duckhorn. So in 1985, Duckhorn was the only winery that the Duckhorns owned at that time. Um, and that was before the creation of Paradox um, in 1994, before the creation of Goldeneye in 1996. Um, and so it basically was just amazing sort of um, wines that didn't make the blend for that vintage that that fell into decoy. And so it's, oh, okay. it's had these long standing roots of being this awesome wine that's at an, a really approachable price point, but that far exceeds the expectation quality wise. And mm -hmm. so that even today, that's always what we're looking to achieve in the decoy wine, because that's where, you know, those classic roots came from. Um, and, I, and I'm every, assuming that's where the name came from, right? Just kind of, it's a decoy, right? It's a, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it, it looks cheap, but then you get into it and you got, you got some really, <laughs> you know, I mean, the price point's cheap and then you get into it and it's a really, it's a, it's yeah. a beautiful wine. Um, and so this, in the eighties, was this the actual just excess Merlot, excess Cabernet that, yeah. that you guys had and and yes. just put it together and and exactly. in a second label that's great yes. so it was really exactly. premium napa napa fruit yes so napa it was napa appellated and it was just awesome wine that maybe you know depending on if they had overage for the overages for the year or, or what it may be or maybe they designed their perfect blend the way they wanted it to be and this was just um sort of um extra wine that that they didn't you know, it didn't fit into that specific blend, blend for that vintage, but it's still awesome, awesome wine. Um, so it, it has unique roots in that way. And then um, in 2008, they, during, you know, the recession was happening here and 
um, they really wanted to launch a wine that was at an approachable price point because a lot of people, you know, were not eating out as much, um, you know, enjoying a bottle of wine at home, but they wanted a, a nice quality bottle of wine. Um, and they, it started as sort of a, you know, we have excess wine to, okay, now we're sourcing for, for wine to make this blend. And then in 2008, we noticed such a interest in that price point and the quality and the style that we were creating that it just took off. And we quickly transitioned to a Sonoma County appellation and then the sky was the limit. So we, in 2010 launched, we had, we had already the red blend. We launched Cabernet, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, uh, a Merlot, a Zinfandel, a Pinot, and they just, they just took off beyond our imagination. Um, but we've continued to make the quality of wine that we've um, been striving to achieve year over year, vintage over vintage, um, in that sort of refined, classic, classically di driven, refined style. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun. That's great. And yeah. uh, so when you guys changed Appalachian, you obviously had moved from a Napa Appalachian to a Sonoma County Appalachian. Mm -hmm. What was the thought process in terms of, you know, uh, were you trying to still kind of replicate the styles of the Napa Appalachian? And then when you brought in Pinot Noir, try to replicate the migration or the golden eye and et cetera, et cetera. Is that, is that kind of the, the philosophy of decoy? I think that the philosophy, I mean, we, we transitioned to Sonoma County to differentiate, differentiate ourselves, um, from Duckhorn. So it was, okay, let's move to Sonoma County. Decoy will be its own brand. It's not really known as that second label anymore. It's going to be its own brand. It needs its own appellation. And then we look to expand the portfolio to include all these different varietals. Mm -hmm. Sonoma County is, is vast. And so there's a lot of sub appellations within Sonoma County that we can play with, with different bridles, specifically Pinot, um, that for the decoy portfolio, it just, it made a lot of sense to move over to Sonoma County. So okay. there are some producers in South Napa and throughout Napa that are producing Pinot, but not in in the volumes or that cool climate style that we were looking for. Um, it's mostly in the Napa Carneros region and those wines are great, um, but we were looking to achieve sort of a different style. So we wanted more of that Russian river focus. Um, so it was more fitting because of its vastness to mm -hmm. have all these different varietals for decoy coming from Sonoma County. So there's a lot to choose from. There's a lot of sub AVAs um, that span, I mean, the whole, Sonoma County is, I mean, there's multiple appellations, multiple sub appellations, and each sub AVA is sort of known for its specific varietals. So you go from cool to warm. So you have a lot of options and flexibility there. That's so cool. That's so cool. And we actually have some wine today. So before we get into it, though, uh, as I'm, I'm holding myself back because I really well, I want to <laughs> get into the tasting. Uh, but yeah, I want to talk a little bit about you. You're you're the winemaker of migration. You're the VP yeah. of winemaking for Decoy. Uh, you started uh, with Decoy back in 2014. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. What, detail your, your, your journey into wine. How did you get into wine? Uh, what did you do in, uh, in terms of, you know, as you started out? And then how did you end up with decoys? I mean, such a big, um, you know, big brand that, that, that yeah. has such a auspicious goals in terms of having, you know, all these varietals from Sonoma County. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And to be honest, I've I'm from Sonoma County, born and raised, third generation. So a lot of people say, well, was your family in wine? No, I just always really had an interest in wine. Um, it more so just from being in this agricultural community and seeing the vines and seeing different industries that are specific to this area and thinking, okay, you know, if I were to do anything and, and want to stay in Sonoma County for the long term, what would be some, you know, career options for me? And that was back in high school. And so even in high school, I um, ended up doing an internship at a winery in Grayton, which is sort of in that Green Valley, um, Sonoma Coast Appalachian. And I 
worked in the laboratory at on the bottling line and I thought this was so cool and I, I I thought you know this is a really cool industry to be in it would keep me in Sonoma County but I also noticed there was something really um fun and energetic and sort of magnetic about the people in the industry and that was what sort of struck me the most it was this fun collaborative atmosphere um, people were passionate about what they were doing. They were excited. Um, and it wasn't, I, I've always enjoyed science, but it, it, it's not a defined science. So there's a lot of creativity and art that goes into it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is just sort of your gut and it, you can't really explain it. And I think it takes historical knowledge. So the more vintages you've worked, you sort of learn along the way and um and that's really cool so that you know you've seen something work or it hasn't worked but there's then there's new new technologies every year coming into the industry so it allows you to be really really creative um and you if you are closed-minded in this industry i think you're doing yourself a disservice there are some you know winemakers winemaking teams that tend to be this is the way we're going to make wine that's not how we make wine with decoy <laughs> france um, or sorry <laughs> or france yeah um it's just really fun because the the sky's the limit i mean there's there's just so much opportunity to learn about new vineyards, new techniques. Um, and then the people at the end of the day is what I find the most appealing about the industry. And our team with D our winemaking team with decoy is just so we're just so open-minded and friendly. There's not a lot of ego. Everyone has a voice. Um, and I think that's really important. So I think it makes us unique in our industry and yeah. um, a lot of fun. And then we're making wine. So it's really yeah. not that serious. <laughs> the, I mean, well, serious, I, but it's fun. I agree with you on the, the culture that the wine industry have is, is second to none. And it's mm -hmm. what's, you know, even on the sales side, on the merchant side, you know, uh, interacting between producers and and uh, customers, it's, it's, it's a great just you know, world to be in and to, to open people's eyes to, to that world is, is really cool. And yeah. that's why I love decoy so much. As I said in the beginning, it, it really is, this kind of opens the door to people mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to get into what wine could really be about. Um, out here in Asia, there's an influx of very cheap, cheap wine that's mm -hmm. not at a cheap, cheap price. <laughs> right. And, um, and that's that's all good and fine for for people you know dabbling and getting into a need just a glass of wine but you know it's it's a little harder to get into you know premiums and and uh, you know decoy is a really great stepping stone uh, mm -hmm. for people to to take and yeah. I love your guys philosophy of uh, you know just the everyday kind of premium wine you know we 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 won't give up our quality. But, right. um, you know, here's a great price point because not everyone could afford Napa Valley every day. Right? right. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I mean, talking to our um, our senior vice president of sales, he always talks about, you know, we haven't changed our price point since we with since we went sort of we launched decoy. I mean, not since 1985, but since we did the full launch in 2010, we have not changed our price point. So which is sort of unheard of with like yeah. increasing great prices and just, you know, cost of living and all yeah. these things. And we said, no, you know, we want to offer this quality of wine to our consumer and we will not change a thing. And so it, it, on our team, it puts the pressure back on to get more creative and make sure we're finding the best vineyards and we're going to achieve that same style year over year. Um, but it makes it a lot of fun too. Yeah. So yeah, we feel really proud of the wines that we're making. Yeah, um, and, you sh and you should be. Yeah, <laughs> you certainly you. should be. <laughs> you know, you guys have a massive project because, you know, decoy, I don't know how many varietals, I mean, pretty much every every one that's that, that you can find in California. Um, so you have all these varietals, you have a new vintage every year. What's what's the logistics like, you know, as a vice president of winemaking? What, what is it like to actually coordinate this massive 
thing because I, I I can't imagine it being like a you know a single varietal kind of vintage at a small winery you know right. <laughs> this is a mat on a massive scale we got it here in the supermarkets here in Manila right yeah. so there there is uh, a certain volume yet a, qu a quality that you have to hit every single time what's the process yeah. like for for people who just don't know yeah so it's a it's a lengthy process um and it starts at the beginning of the growing season every year so we go through and look at okay how much wine do we need to produce for this vintage and everything starts with how many grapes we need to procure um, in what appellations and in what varietals to make sure that we're going to be able to offer our wines to everyone um our motto is always like, do not sell out, make sure that everyone that, you know, wants to access our wines can, and that's very complicated. <laughs> so our sales team has to give us very accurate numbers to be able to do that so that we can achieve vint a vintage over vintage, make sure that we're not running out of one vintage until before we get to the next. Um, so that can be a little complicated, but yeah, we start with a process where we're looking at a full picture of how many we call we call them tons so a ton of fruit um is just a basic weight so 2000 mm -hmm. pounds i don't know what metric system you guys yeah. are in. something in that. What, yeah, google google it <laughs> so we speak in tons of the fruit yeah, and yeah. um and basically um it's it's everything from where how many tons do we need what varietals which we have multiple wineries, you know, kind of spread all over which wineries are, you know, have the expertise to achieve the quality that we're looking to achieve for that specific varietal. And then, so we'll go through sourcing, uh, uh, fruit to where that, where that fruit is going to be processed and fermented and aged, um, what barrels we're looking to, um, barrel down into and all of that goes back to the style that we're trying to achieve what percent new french oak and so there's a lot of complexity to that mostly logistics like how do we yeah. get this wine once it's already made um we have to to one bottle so we have one bottling line um that we bottle through and it's just constantly you know we're bottling every day now just pump, so it's, pumping wine just, out <laughs> we're so busy but it still feels like a small run winery and we have a small team which i think really helps us because we're, we remain nimble so we're able to just call each other and kind of be flexible on the fly yeah. but um i think in order to achieve the the volume that we have achieved and in order to get wines to all of our consumers that um we want to get our wines to uh, we had to make sure that we were going to provide a quality product at the end of the day. And in order to do that, we've done rigorous and very diligent work on the front end. So sourcing specific vineyards from specific AVAs um, all around California and making sure that those vineyards are performing year over year. And basically how we do that is we all sit down as a winemaking team and say, decoy is this for this specific varietal and then we grade all of our wines for uh, down to every single vineyard and say did we he hit the the quality mark from this specific vineyard and then year over year is it meeting the mark to hit the quality that we need for this blend and if it's not it's out and then we're looking for other sourcing so it really all wow. goes back to the specific vineyards that the fruit is coming from um, and there's a lot of logistics and trucking and all that along the way. And, and the, I think that's fun. It's more yeah, like yeah. kind of a big puzzle. Are these um, third party vineyards or does Duckhorn own these vineyards? Both. So we have both, a okay. vineyards, uh, mostly in Sonoma County, some in Mendocino County, um, for Duckhorn, we have a state vineyards in Napa, and then, um, we do source from growers, um, all around the central coast and the North coast. There, a lot of the growers we've, work, we've worked with for a really long time. Um, but what we're noticing is that, you know, as I was mentioning, we are constantly challenged with having to, you know, increase quality year over year. And we're using technology to do that. We're going and 
looking for partnerships with growers that are kind of young up and coming growers out in the vineyard using different technologies on the vineyard side. So uh. we need their expertise and they we've noticed a um, increase in quality over the years. It's kind of gone from like old school grower, old school farming practices to how can we do this more efficient, increase quality using technology. And so you it's know, really cool. That's really excites me about wine is because, you know, wine has this incredible tradition, you know, 8,000 years, it's been around, it's their liquid ritual. It's our, it's yeah. our thing, you know, and yet, you know, everyone I talk to, they say, everything's changing so fast. There's so much technology. It's, it's, it's evolving. Yeah. It's evolving. And I mean, absolutely incredible. You don't see anything like it. That's, that's mm -hmm. constantly changing every day yet still has that incredibly long tradition, of, exactly. you know, being around and it's, it's magical almost. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's, fun. it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So. You don't want to lose that sense of like having the history and, and all of that. I think it's just at the end of the day, is it making a better, quality wine. Yes. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's look further into that. Why not? You know, constant evolution, okay. right? Con exactly. Getting better and better and better. That's what it's exactly. all about. <laughs> so and you we have were, this, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 please, please. Oh, you were asking me before, just like how I kind of got into the wine industry. I'd mentioned high school, but mm -hmm. I got into the wine industry, um, right out of college. And, uh, actually my first job was a viticulture technician. So I worked at Ferrari Carano in the vineyards, boots in the ground. Um, and that experience taught me a lot about you need to have awesome fruit sourcing to make an awesome wine at the end of the day. It's really, if you set yourself up for success on the front end and have great fruit and work with your growers on creating that style in the vineyard, it makes your life a lot easier when you get, when that fruit gets to the winery. And then we can put our decoy twist on it once it gets to the winery. Mm -hmm. But if you're not doing your diligence in the vineyard, you're going to have to do like pull a lot of tricks out of your bag mm -hmm. when it gets to the winery and it could lead to over manipulation of the wines. And so just having that background and then through the years, I, I worked in uh, laboratories. I've worked um, at two different wineries, Artessa and Jameson Ranch, where I not only did the winemaking side, but I also managed their grower relations side. So I've always sort of had that grower relations or vineyard side mixed with the winemaking side. And I think that helps to keep a good perspective on, okay, what's happening in the vineyard and why is this happening at the winery? And if you lose that connection, it's really hard to then, you just don't know what's coming when it gets to yeah. the winery. It's hard to, to fix problems that could have been fixed early on. That makes a lot of sense. It's really, everything's kind of in the foundations and, you know, mm -hmm. these things are grown in earth <laughs> and you got to exactly. make sure it's done. Agriculture the, the process is, is done correctly. Yeah. Exactly. I heard offhand once that, uh, and please, please, I want to hear your your thoughts on this, that someone mentioned that winemaking is 90% in the vineyard and then 10% in the winemaking. Would you say that that's accurate? I think that's close. I yeah. don't know if I would say 90, 10. Um, and I don't, and, it, and honestly, I think that. Yeah, we got to give you guys some more credit, right? 20, 30, yeah. right? <laughs> I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say winemaking. So it's, okay. I would say the the quality of the wine okay. at the end of the day is probably nine, 80 to 90% from the vineyard. And okay. then what you can do in the winery could change the wine mm -hmm. 10, 20% to make it a better wine. But are you going to create this amazing blow your socks off wine if you don't have a good starting core? No. That makes so much sense. Yeah, but it's but the everyone's working just as hard as everyone else. Yeah. So I think that from the growers side of things, from our vineyard managers to our winemaking team and bottling teams and marketing teams and sales teams, everyone's working on all cylinders. So it's not that our job is easy because we're dealing with all the logistics and all these other things, but the qual the quality of wine definitely. I think if you have a good um, foundation, then you're setting yourself up for success. And I guess that's a, that's why uh, regions are so important, right? Why why yes. California is so beloved as as a wine growing region? Yeah, you know, you're not in Iowa growing wine because it's just you're not 
producing the type of yeah. grapes you need, right? The type of fruit that you need. Yeah. Um, and I mean, every state now in the U.S. is producing wine, but we, to create the decoy style, that's just, uh, we are California. That's yeah. just decoy. So. Absolutely. And California is better. I'm a Californian. So okay. <laughs> we're, we're, we're good. <laughs> A great. Well, you know, that that's so exciting. And, you know, we talked a lot about Sonoma County Appalachian for decoy, but we have a new vintage coming in, uh, mainly 2019, uh, one 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys have a major shift. You guys are shifting from Sonoma County to a California Appalachian. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for people who don't know exactly what that means, could, could you explain what the significance of that shift? Yeah. And I think that I'm glad that you're asking me to explain it because I think that it means something different for decoy than maybe some other producers that have always been California or have made the shift to California. So decoy specifically, we made the shift to California because of our growth. And so our, we are getting, um, as we get larger, we, Sonoma County is only so big. And so we need to look at different appellations to see what different appellations will help us to still achieve that decoy style or outperform what we were creating in Sonoma County. And so that's how we looked at it when we started looking at the transition in 2015 we were just dabbling in sub AVAs around the state. Okay. What works for Chardonnay, you know, and, and it's mostly the red blends that we've um, transitioned first, and then we're going to start transitioning the whites, but it's been such a fun process, but it's taken a lot of rigor, a lot of time. We've been very cautious about it. So we went down to the central coast and we looked at Santa Barbara, Paso. We looked at uh, further into Mendocino. We looked into the foothills and Specifically for the Cabernet, the Cabernet, I would say, has been the, the most challenging to expand into California because there's a lot of different sub AVAs, mm -hmm. but it has a unique profile in every sub AVA, and it's very different than the traditional Sonoma County profile. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of our goal was how do we sort of mimic the Sonoma County profile? That was our goal at first. But then we added in this rigorous grading um, uh, plan, basically, where we taste through all the vineyards and we taste them blind. So mm -hmm. we want, I think when we started the process, we were thinking, okay, we're going from Sonoma County to California. We have a bias towards Sonoma County, just a pat, like house palette bias. <laughs> And so we, we did double blind tastings on everything. No one spoke until after each flight, we did do flights of six. We would taste like 40 wines a day and go through um, all the People wines. People don't realize then, how hard that is, tasting 40 different wines in I know, a city. 40 That's so hard. Like a lot to many people, but it's really hard because you have a lot of thought going on when you're exactly. tasting. All the sensory is happening. You're trying to put it into words. Um, and so we surprised ourselves, which was really exciting. And we were, we did everything graded A, B, C, D, D out, C potential, but we'd have to like work with the grower or on the winemaking side to make that work. A's and B's, those were core decoy. And this is what we're trying to achieve. And we surprised, we were surprised and it was really cool. And we saw like, there's this cool sub AVA in Mendocino that's like outperforming Sonoma. There's a cool sub AVA in the central coast that's way outperforming Sonoma year over year. And so we brought all those, we sort of cherry picked all those vineyards, brought them together. And now we're creating blends based on that new rigor and the, and, and sort of now California's our oyster. And so we can kind of go dabble into all these sub AVAs. I don't know how many wineries are doing that specifically. A lot of um, wineries transition to California to decrease their overall costs. Yeah. That's not how we went into it. That's Got not it. the way that we looked at it. We just looked at Sonoma County and it, it used to look so big and now it doesn't look that and big. Now it doesn't anymore. look so big. There's so many more regions out there. Yeah. And well, so from a sales perspective, yeah. you know, it's, it's always been interesting because like what you said, a lot of, a lot of wineries go to the California Appalachian, meaning that you could pick from anywhere in the state. And mm -hmm. as a low to, to, to lower costs. And mm -hmm. traditionally uh, for us, it's like, you know, if you see a California uh, Appalachian, it's, it's a cheaper wine. 
Yeah. Um, definitely there's, 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 uh, um, exceptions for sure, but that was the overall, um, sentiment, mm -hmm. but you know, the way that you explain it to me, uh, makes a lot of sense because it gives you guys for, especially what, what decoys mission is, it gives you guys a lot more tools to really fine tune, uh, a, a California expression loosely based on Sonoma County, right? right. And uh, I, I'm really, really excited. I'm, I see the glass is just like sitting right there. I'm like, I want to okay. taste it so bad because <laughs> I haven't tasted this new, uh, the new Appalachian okay. yet, with, but um, yeah. I'm really excited to taste it with you. Yeah. Um, so let's, shall we hit into it? You want to yeah, try that Pinot? Let's do the Pinot first. Yeah, sounds great. Okay. Awesome. I'm going to. Um, okay. Yeah, it's been interesting. So, and just to, sort of emphasize that. So when we, when we transitioned the Pinot and the cab, those both transitioned in 18, 2018. And then, um, the other red bridles will, will transition in 19. Um, some are still very Sonoma County dominant. So we didn't yeah. change anything. We just wanted everything to be California. And so we were worried, honestly, about, talking to the, our sales team and saying, okay, we're going California, but this is why, and you're really going to have to let people know. But to be honest with wine, the wine speaks for itself. And so then once people started tasting, they said, oh, okay, <laughs> we, we believe you. And, yeah. and we taste every vintage, vintage to vintage. So we just had a cool tasting um, with our whole executive team last week, where we tasted the last three vintages in verticals. And we're, we were all saying, okay, now we think we're qualitatively better where we're at now than we were three years ago. And that's really cool. And that that's was really the transition cool. from Sonoma to California. Yeah. I and I think it's so important to state that, you know, and then I'm yeah. so happy we're doing this here because, you know, a lot of wine is preconceptions. A lot of the entire culture is preconceptions. Yeah. You got to drink wine with this food, blah, 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 rules, 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 rules. Um, oh. And, you know, very <laughs> few, very little, you know, you don't get a lot of opportunities to talk to people and say, hey, this is the reason why we're doing this. And it's expansive. Yeah. And it's actually, you know, it may look on paper that we're taking a step back, but no, we're actually taking a step forward. Right. Um, and that's the education of it all, right? Exactly. And then the proof is in the wine. And that's like, you know, luckily we didn't really see and much pushback when we did the transition to California. And then I think that's because a lot of the, the, we call them the gatekeepers. And I don't know if that's the appropriate term, but so the, <laughs> the, you know, the people that are distributors that are bringing on the, in the wines to then um, distribute out to the different retailers. So like, they're going to be the ones tasting the wines first, and then it's passing through their um, tests, you know, and they're saying, oh yeah, this is qualitatively the same or better. Okay. We believe you you're in, <laughs> but then it's up to the consumer too. And it's funny. Like I always tell my friends and people that I run into and people that are kind of getting into wine or more experienced with wine tasting at the end of the day, what do you like to drink is, you know, if this wine, if you like tasting this wine and you like drinking this wine, drink that wine, you know, and it's all Who cares what it says on the, the label, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the wine is the wine. <laughs> exactly. Are you enjoying it? Then yeah. you should drink that wine. If it's a great price. Wow. Even better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So exactly. yeah. And I, I think it makes a lot of sense, you know, with Duckhorn has, grown so much. I mean, the portfolio you have, I don't know, five or six or seven or whatever, uh, different brands all over California mm -hmm. and even outside of California, you got cameras right. back in Washington. Back. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it makes a lot of sense for decoy to not be the Sonoma County wine, but to be the California wine. And that's mm -hmm. you guys entry point. And, uh, I think yeah. from a sales perspective, that's a, that's really good, um, in terms of, you know, bringing people into your world. Right. And it's awesome for the flexibility there. We have, you know, we're able to, if there is excess wine within Duckhorn or Paradox or Calera down on the central coast, um, we can bring those wines into decoy. And so a lot of times we'll blend in different blends from those other sister wineries. And that still sort of has that trickle down effect 
in some cases, less so now than it used to, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are popular um, wines. So we're definitely sure. the big sister out of the group, but um, yeah, but it makes it a lot of fun. And then we're just sort of all encompassing and we've spread our team over California as well. So we have a dedicated winemaker down on the central coast. We have a vice president of central coast wine growing who oversees um, that team and then Calera as well. So we're just sort of spread out all over, but very small and tight still as well. So awesome. A lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah. So we have the Pinot Noir. This is the 2019 California decoy Pinot. So this is the second vintage in the new California Appalachian. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about it? Yeah. So this is um, sort of a, a mix of multiple AVAs. Um, we definitely were looking for that more elegant, refined style. We're not looking to push the ripeness as far as bricks goes on picking decisions. So we're picking around 23 and a half, 24 and a half bricks, um, keeping that natural acidity. But we want the phenological development in the fruit to have the really nice refined tannins come through. So um, looking for elegance. Uh, it's we on most of our wines, we try to have a little more of a reserved oak profile to not overpower the fruit. So we're looking for oak that just sort of lifts the fruit. A lot, a lot of this um, oak is medium, medium plus toast. It's around 30% new French oak um, with the remainder being neutral. And just looking for bright acid balance and, and sort of a true sense of place. Um, and now that's pretty broad now that we're speaking to California, but just as an overall um, look into the different Appalachians, there's fruit in here from Mendocino, Anderson Valley, Sonoma County. Um, so that'd be your Russian River, uh, Green Valley, Petaluma Gap. Um, and then we ventured into the central coast. So there's fruit coming in from the Santa Lucia Highlands, Santa Barbara. So we go, we span pr pretty far south and Pino in particular does very well along the entire California coastline. Mm. So the more westerly you stay, uh, Pino performs very well. And we found that Pino is actually, even though that it's known to be a more finicky grape, it tends to have the most um, flexibility when it comes to blending and choosing different sub AVAs for the blend okay. across California where Cabernet we found, okay, there's a specific amount we can get from this sub AVA, but we have to be dominantly focused still in Mendocino and Sonoma County. So there's a difference there where Pinot just kind of it's, it changes and it's super yeah. unique, but we're, we're finding there's more sort of like deep lush blue fruit coming through yeah. from the more southerly Santa Barbara County, like your Santa Rita vineyards. Um, there's that really nice red sort of bright strawberry fruit coming from Monterey, Santa Lucia Highlands. And then you have your nice rusticity coming through from your traditional Sonoma County focus, which is uh, Green Valley, Russian River, Carnero. So um, I think you can kind of feel all those sub AVs come together here. Um, and we were just looking for that overall balance in the wine. That's great. Well, I'm going to I'm going to take a sip. Tried it? But this okay. is looking good. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. I, I love the, you know, the kind of Burgundian style that you guys have with your Pinot Noir because a big um, movement, I guess, in Pinot in California right now is like kind of overbearing, very big yeah. wine that I, I like actually I I, I I think it's very interesting uh very interesting is a different direction and um you know I never thought Pinot could taste like that ever but you guys have this classical you know back to your you know your mission statement this classical traditional style that's a proper Pinot Noir um mm -hmm. you know you, you're still the color is really nice you could kind of see a little bit through it it's nice and yeah Delicate. We always say you should be able to see print through. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because some of these other Pinot Noirs, which I'm not, I'm not hating on. I like it. I like it. But there's just, it's just uh, ink. Yeah. <laughs> Total really, ink. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that that can be achieved by pushing ripeness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, different extraction methods once you get to the vineyard. And so all that sort of, it goes against our premise, as you were saying, of like, okay, we're picking at ideal ripeness. We're looking to let that fruit shine, let those vineyards shine through into the wine. Um, 
those wines are still very unique and a lot of people enjoy them. It's just different from our, our style that we're looking to achieve. Um, for me, I like, sometimes I like the concentrated wines because they're so different than, um, the decoy style. And even with the, in the migration portfolio, we have like our drum Canyon Pinot, which is from Santa Rita. It's super concentrated, super blue, super dark work this year I, we were tasting it and I'm thinking this tastes, this looks like Syrah. <laughs> so dark. Um, but what I don't like just me personally is when it pushes into the overly sweet, overly yeah. sappy kind of saturated, that's a little too much for me. Um, and just not as easy or, or approachable in just in my personal opinion, but everyone obviously, as I said before, has their own subjective opinion. And yeah. yeah. And sometimes and, I don't want 15% alcohol in my Pinot Noir. Yeah, you gotta watch out. <laughs> it's just <laughs> like, whoa, to... okay, one glass, you're done. <laughs> That's a weekend drinker. No. Well, as the as the migration um winemaker, I'm I'm gonna guess that one of your favorite varietals is Pinot Noir. Yeah, I love Pinot. Um, I love Chardonnay too. Okay. Uh I I have made Pinot, let's see. I mean, I guess we were making it at Ferrari Crano in, in a small way. It was mostly Sauvignon Blanc, Fumé Blanc, Chardonnay, uh, Bordeaux varietals from when I started in the industry. And then I worked at Edna Valley. We were doing Pinot Chardonnay Focus, Artessa Pinot, Pinot Chardonnay Focus. Um, and then with Decoy, it sort of ran the gamut of different varietals, but um, my at-home go-to is always Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So those are my two yeah. favorites. Um, but I, I like all of our children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yeah. I, I love Pinot as well. My cat is named Pinot. Oh, uh, cute. <laughs> my cat, our warehouse cat we, that we found, I found him in our in our wine warehouse here in Manila. And uh, so I'm oh. like, okay, well, what am I going to do with you? And uh, yeah. I'll take you home and you'll become a wine cat and your name yeah. you know, Pino stuck. And uh, uh, she does, she just still won't drink it with me, but uh, I'm going to get <laughs> her there one the of these best. days. <laughs> So is Pinot awesome. your favorite as well? Yeah, it, it, Pinot was one of the wines that got me into it. Um, yeah. I, I, I have to say that the one wine that reminded me, that that got me into wine was a cap. It was a Schaefer's 1.5 uh, with a big yeah. steak, you know, that traditional thing. But in terms of daily drinking and, and you know, being in the industry and, you know, trying not to get totally blasted every day, Pinot Noir uh, and now more and more these days, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc. I'm becoming, I'm like a, I'm downgrading to lighter wines on the daily I because am too. Yes. it's uh, and it's hot here. You know, we're talking yeah. over a hundred degrees every day, right? It's like those hard, yeah. heavy reds. Ugh. You know, a nice, cool, cooler Pinot is is, is much nicer. Uh, That's you know, on a true. Day. Yeah, I think yeah, Sauvignon Blanc would be nice for that. Our rosé. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just launched our sparkling. I don't know if you've tried. I know. It. I saw that on Instagram. It looks it looks uh, awesome. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, let's go into the cab. Um, okay. So we have the cab here. And for the viewers, we got the two bottles here. And then I actually have the migration and the duck, um, the duckhorn cab, the two bigger, the big, bigger sister, bigger brother, <laughs> here. <Yeah. laughs> um, as well as your limited, because you guys also recently released the limited, um, which we have in, in market right now. Um, and so, but before we get into that, let, uh, tell me a little bit about this. This is the uh, decoy California Cabernet Sauvignon 2019. Yeah. So as I was saying before, we had to be very selective with the sub AVAs and sort of bring them all together to retain that classic decoy style. So what we landed on was Sonoma County, pretty much Sonoma County focus. We Mendocino uh, tends to keep with that sort of red rustic fruit, um, some blue fruit coming through. We found that that's a really nice, um, blend into, or a nice combination into this final blend. And then also sourcing from Paso, which tends to be more of that red focus, all, has nice rustic rusticity, but we tend to stick to vineyards more on that west side of Paso, where it's a little bit cooler to keep that nice tension um, on the palate and the nice uh, tannins. And then down into Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara has been a really cool um appellation to play with and it really brings in these blue and black 
roots um, and creates sort of a brambly uh, aromatic and finish uh, and brings in a really cool complexity. So I feel like as far as um, we, we, we sought out to achieve the decoy style, which is to keep that red rust, rustic style with nice spice coming through from the oak and from the fruit. Um, but what we found was that we could create this lush, cool, um, more layered complex style when we started dabbling down further on the coast. So um, I think it kind of brings everything together. It also has a reserved uh, oak profile. Um, depending on the vintage, it's around 35 to 40% new French oak, um, medium, medium plus. And we're looking for just really that nice uh, complex spice component, uh, fire toasted oak that just lifts the palate, um, adds a nice toastiness, adds a nice spice, but doesn't overpower the fruit. Yeah, I, I just tasting, I'm, when I'm tasting it, when you're, you're speaking, I, that spice really comes out. It's um, mm -hmm. um, surprising, actually. It's not as much spice as I, I, would, I would expect, but it's, it, it's really yeah. nice. And, it, and I would imagine go really well with food. This is, seems yeah. to me like what you'd want at dinner every night. <laughs> Yeah. I, and with the spice, I usually talk about it more of like that baking spice, like that mm -hmm. nice clove, some nutmeg, nice toastiness from the finish. You're getting a little bit of vanilla and caramel from the oak, but nothing overpowering. So it's very subtle, sort of in the background. What would you say? Um, I know you guys are really trying to replicate that kind of Sonoma County uh, of taste profile that you guys had before, but moving from Sonoma County to Calif uh, California, bringing in Paso Robles, Santa Barbara, what would you think is the biggest change that those uh, appellations brought to the wine? Um, I think they bring depth to the wine. So, um, and honestly, a little more lushness, um, especially I could, see that. I could definitely Santa see Barbara. That. So it's more just kind of the velvety tannins are coming through. You're picking up on sort of that, those black, like blackberry, uh, black cherry, um, some kind of leather uh, aromatics, and then almost getting into some of our Santa Barbara vineyards can kind of get into that like olive character, which is really interesting. So you have to be careful with that, even though it's really cool and complex as a interesting layer. We don't want to go too far in that direction. Yeah, yeah. That would you don't want something unfamiliar, more, right? Yeah. From the decoy style. And, and, you know, this is all new for us. And as we move forward, we'll probably stop talking about, okay, our home was Sonoma County. And how do we achieve Sonoma County? It's like, how do we just achieve the best wine for decoy wine. So the best can. expression of California in just general, California. right? Yeah. yeah, we're just trying to, you know, yeah, give the best expression of California, which is so fun. It's a lot of work. I yeah. mean, yeah. <laughs> even <laughs> just so you explaining fun. it to me is like, oh my God, I can't even imagine the logistics it's involved. It's a lot of work. It's a yeah. lot of communication. But as I said before, we have such a great team. We're all just, you know, vibrant and energetic and kind of, We've been some some of us have been with the the company a long time, um, and some of us are newer to the company. And everyone just brings this great attitude of any everything's on the table. So there's nothing that's like, hey, this is how we do it. This is how it's done. Period. It's cool. Bring it to the table. Let's explore it. And how do we make the best wine possible? So you guys also introduced the limited edition, the yeah. what, I, what I like to call the the decoy blue label. <laughs> for yeah, the, you know, the, a lot of Johnny Walker too, drinkers so. here. So the blue <laughs> label really does, you know, uh, yeah. speak to them on the sales level, but yeah, we call I, it I decoy it blue. <laughs> decoy blue. Yeah. There we go. Beautiful bottle. I love it. Thank you. Uh, exquisite wine. I mean, great expression of Napa Valley. What, why did you guys decide that you needed to have a Napa Valley, um, uh, expression of decoy where, you know, there's duck horn obviously and, 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 and paradox. Right. Yeah, so this, um, basically, last year, we were just sort of thinking of creative ways. We really weren't sure, um, or it was the last couple years, we really weren't sure, like, what our consumers were looking for. We're making this transition to California, but we wanted to create a more premium tier that would keep our decoy drinkers, like, you know, it, the, the prices aren't that different. So um, it's about a difference of like a $5 price point, depending on what you find at your local grocer, grocer discounted, whatever. But um, 
they wanted to make sure that we were expansive enough within that decoy uh, portfolio to make sure that everyone was sort of, you know, happy with the style of wines they were drinking and then kind of moving people up to that premium tier. So then decoy limited could open the doors then to get people in back into drinking duck corn as their daily drinker and things like that. Um, so when we launched decoy limited, it was just how it was just a premiumization of decoy, which has been really fun for our team. Um, not that we didn't have enough work to do already, but <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's been fun to explore more of the Napa Valley AVAs. So we have the Napa Valley Cab, we have the Napa Valley Red Blend, and then we also launched the Sonoma Coast Pinot and the Sonoma Coast Chardonnay. Um, and so this year we've done a lot of research on exploring new vineyards, and I just think it it just creates diversity amongst our brand, and it keeps people interested, and it it's showing that we're you know we're constantly evolving, and yeah. that you know, if for some reason down the road, if they're wanting to try something new, that's not a far fetch for them to then premium or go up to that next premium level and then try different Napa Valley sub AVAs. Those sub AVAs, for instance, in Napa are different than not the sub AVAs and the vineyards are different than Duckhorn and Paradox, obviously, mm -hmm. but it's our decoy spin on Napa Valley. So it's just, it's, it's been a lot of fun for our team specifically. And I think that the wines, the wines are showing really well. I know we're really proud of them. A lot of our, our winemaking team have personally purchased them, you know, for home drinking. Um, and it just, it, yeah, it creates diversity and keeps people interested. You know, I got to give big kudos to you and the Duckhorns because I guess the Duckhorns, they had this uh, plan in action since since uh, the 80s even. But you guys kind of capture, you can live within the Duckhorn portfolio uh, as a wine drinker and just get yeah. all of California. <laughs> you don't even have to leave the Duckhorn uh, world. No. <laughs> you can, you but... need something from this region. We got it for you. And, uh, and I just, Washington, guys, the and Washington yeah. exactly. I'm sure you guys are going to start uh, owning Oregon here soon. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, I, I just think it's incredible. I mean, and uh, so you guys definitely deserve being public going, you know, growing to that position. And I, you know, I, I continue to evangelize you guys out here all the time. One of my favorite wineries and, and you guys, Thank you know, you. the hard work that your team does is really shows itself in the wine. Now, Thank you very much. Before we go, I, I want to do kind of a quick, you know, uh, quick questions, uh, rapid fire, because we have so many varietals of decoy coming in. Uh, we don't have enough time to kind of go and taste everything, but I want to get your like 30 second elevator pitch on each of these. So I'll give you a varietal in the year and you just give, you know, give me the 30 to 10, uh, 30 okay. seconds to <laughs> one minute pitch here. So we got... Uh, we did the Pinot, we did the Cab, we got now the California Merlot 2019. Okay, so uh, the 2019 Merlot is still pretty much Sonoma County focused. So we have dabbled in some sub AVAs around California. We found that for the style that we're trying to achieve, we're still very dry creek focused. That's a sub AVA within Sonoma County, um, as well as Alexander Valley. And so we're looking for red, rustic, um, refined tannin, but we're also looking for that historical, you know, lushness of this. If, you, if Cabernet is too heavy for you or too intense of a wine and um, you're looking for something a little lighter and more, um, uh, has more refined tannin, that's gonna be the Merlot. Um, so more red fruit focused, um, but really nice deep layers and concentrated fruit. And again, that Dry Creek Alexander Valley focus and just a really nice wine all around. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, next we have the Decoy Red Blend 2019, the original varietal that, or blend yeah. that you guys did. So the red blend has changed over the years and it's basically, we can cherry pick from uh, different, from different varietals, from different sub AVAs. And what we're looking to achieve at the end of the day is um, we're looking for dark fruit, lots of layers, lots of texture, um, deep, concentrated, nice body compared to 
the Merlot and the Cabernet, we would say this is our more lush wine. And so if you're looking for something that sits a little, you know, it's soft, but sits heavy on the palate, has nice richness. Um, and we like to describe the red blend as having that brambly uh, character and um, having a lot of spice. And so we're adding our, our decoy barrel touch to this to have that added spice component. And so it's really complex and juicy and um, a lot of dark fruit. So um, definitely drink with food or drink on its own. It's, it's, it's a great fun wine. Do you guys advertise what the blend is or is that proprietary? Um, it changes every year. Um, it's gone from, it's mostly Cabernet focused, but then we, it's, it's, it's Cabernet dominant. And then we have a, um, pretty large percentage of Merlot. So Cabernet Merlot, Petit Zara, Petit Verdot, Zin, um, and the sky's the limit. So there's yeah. Malbec and, um, Tempranillo some years. Wow. It depends on what's working for the blend. And, um, but I would say the dominant varietals would be Cab, Merlot, Petit Syrah, Petit Verdot, Zin, Malbec. Cool, so cool. Varying percentages, yeah. All right, now we get into our, oh, the, the last red, which is these Decoy Zinfandel 2019. The one okay. I'm actually really excited to try. I haven't tried your Zinfandel yet. <laughs> yeah, it's delicious. So, um, so the Zin is in... So it's Dry Creek focused. So still back in the Sonoma County region. Um, we have dabbled across the state. We found that Dry Creek sort of hits that stylistic profile that we're looking for. Concentrated, lush, um, nice spice, but it's I, it's definitely not a overly, um, like it's not a hot zin where some of the other zins that are coming out of dry Creek tend to be high alcohol, have a lot of heat. They're really concentrated, um, ha can have a lot of residual sugar. This is made in a more balanced style. So we're picking at ideal ripeness. Um, and so it just has that really nice elegance and balance and a lot of sort of, uh, red blue fruit and that nice spice and really, really, really soft tannins on this wine. So it's a, it's a really easy drinker. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, okay. Last two we have the Sauvignon okay. Blanc, the decoy Sauvignon Blanc 2020. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. So we just, uh, bottled this not too long ago and it's tasting great. Um, we have this year, since we are dabbling across California, we were interested in trying out some vineyards from Santa Barbara, which, which brings this really nice citrus component to the wine, sort of like that lemon, um, lemon custard kind of comes through. So we wanted to be careful with having like too much sweetness, sweet citrus mixed with that, um, sort of balance between, we like to be between kind of that green grassy, but that's not the dominant profile we're looking for. And we want that to be perfectly balanced with a nice tropical component. And so this sort of brings that Santa Barbara brings in that nice citrus and adds to that cool blend and balance of having all of those um, aromas come together. But yeah, we're looking for that perfect ripeness, which takes a lot of vigor when it comes to making that harvest decision in the vineyard. So um, our winemaking team, including myself, we're out every single day tasting grapes in the vineyard, making that perfect, perfect pick call in the vineyard. And a couple of days before harvest, we'll say, okay, we're ready to pick. And what we'll start to notice is you're getting, when you're, when you're, when you're tasting the berries, you'll go from like a bell pepper to sort of like a noble bell pepper. We're getting into some more tropical fruits, citrus fruits, grapefruit. And then boom, you hit like that fine line between like kind of greeny could be New Zealand, Australia style to, okay, we're getting into lychee and pineapple and tropical. And so we try to hit it right at that mark to create that perfect balance and have that nice acidity. So um, that's what we're looking to achieve. And I think this, uh, the 2020 really uh, showcases what we were trying to achieve. And it has a really cool floral component this year. That's, unique to the 2020 vintage, which is, is really fun. I know that the Duckhorn Sauvignon Blanc blends a little bit of Semillon into it. Do you guys yeah. blend any Semillon into the decoy? We don't. Um, okay. we, we try to be, we've done that purposely to try to be stylistically different than okay. 
duck horn. Um, but traditionally they've blended up to 16% um, wow. of semion into the duck horn blends. And they do have about, uh, about 10% barrel fermented, um, new barrel ferment in wow. their blend as well. So it adds these really cool complex layers. Um, and that semion adds sort of this acid backbone that can sort of create this nice mid palate tension and weight. Um, so I think that really works for the Napa Valley where on, in the, on the decoy side, we're looking just to be kind of fun and bright and tropical and have interesting notes of, you know, your, your, pineapple, lychee, grapefruit, citrus, and that all coming together where they're, I, I tend to think of duck corn as more of a, um, it has a lot of depth. It's more of um, a, a citrus style of, of Sauvignon Blanc, in my opinion, um, but both are really nice and both are very different, which is great because it adds um, sort of complexity among, amongst our brands, which is great. Well, from a sales perspective, that's great too, because I don't want just yeah. some, you know, uh, copy of what the duck horn is. It's something right. that's different and something interesting and new. And I think that I'm really excited to try it. So I, yeah, I actually pulled, I, I, I twisted some, uh, some arms to, to get the Sauvignon oh, Blanc in because, oh, we have the duck horn. I'm like, no, 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 no it's different. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, so the final one we have is the decoy Chardonnay 2019, which is actually still the Sonoma County uh, appellation, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in 2020, that will change to California as well. So the, the Chardonnay is Sonoma County focused for that blend and will continue to be so. Um, the, we primarily source from uh, Russian River, Green Valley, um, a little bit in the Dry Creek area, and then Alexander Valley. So Alexander Valley brings that bright acid focus, um, your, your uh, citrus core, and what we're we want to be styled stylistically different with decoy than migration and Costa Brown, which are Russian River Green Valley focus. Um, and we are definitely looking for a bright, clean profile with nice acid. Um, and we're only about 30 percent new French oak, so a more reserved um, or, or restrained uh, approach to our oak philosophy. And then we're also more on the restrained approach on our malolactic philosophy as well. So it depends on the year, but we're only doing about 20% malolactic. And so we're looking for to keep that natural acid retention, um, keep that really fresh profile. Um, and I think that really shines through in the wine as well. And it makes them very stylistically different than your migration that's around anywhere from 50 to 75% malolactic fermentation, 40%, 30 to 40% new French oak, and then uh, Costa Brown's 100% malolactic fermentation. So it kind of adds that nice richness. And I mean, I love those wines as well, but this is, look, this is more of your bright fruit forward um, uh, profile, so. Great, a little more approachable and, you know, kind of yeah, fresh fruit kind of thing, right? Fresh yeah. fruit, yeah. fresh acid, and really nice balance. So it's a really great food wine as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Well, Dana, thank you so much for yeah, taking the you. time to talk with us today. You know, decoy has been exploding in the market. We're in, you know, 24 uh, high end grocery stores here in Manila. People can't get enough of it. Um, the the new That's vintages great. are on the way. So <laughs> Um, I'd love to have you over here to Manila. If you want to join Anytime. Carl on one of his sales, sales uh, trips, <laughs> uh, we'd love to put a, an event up with decoy. Uh, hopefully I can make it back to the States sometime soon and hook up with you guys. Um, before we go, uh, can you tell the viewers how, how they can uh, follow you guys, how they could follow decoy? Yeah. So we have a lot of different, um, ways that you can follow us. So you can go to our website, uh, duckhornwines.com, or we have multiple website for multiple websites for all of our different brands, decoywines.com. Um, and then you can find us on so social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, and there's always someone there. If you have questions that will chat back. So feel free to ask questions or, um, I'm always looking on there too. If you have a question specifically for me, I'll probably be able to answer. So um, feel awesome. free to reach out.
Yeah. <laughs> well, we, I, I certainly will. I'm going to have questions okay. as the, as the new vintages Perfect. come in, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. Have a wonderful uh, remainder of your evening in California. I'm going to get started on my day. It's nice and early here in Manila. Yeah. <laughs> and, Enjoy uh, the day. I have yeah, a great start. <laughs> I certainly will. I got two beautiful glasses of wine to start the day. So I'm, uh, I am very excited. It's going to, you know, <laughs> uh, so thank you so much and um, cheers. Cheers. Yeah, thank you. And I would love to come out for a visit anytime. <laughs> Fantastic. Let Let's know. get through this pandemic and uh, we're going to set up yeah. events because I am okay. tired of sitting in my basement <laughs> just doing this. <laughs> good. Okay. Bye. Thank you.